Greetings from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're very glad you could join us today for another in our continuing series of virtual Voices of the Game programs. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Education Department here at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And today we're going to be doing something uh, that's very timely, very important with regard to the statistical record keeping of the Negro Leagues. We're going to have with us uh, a couple of guests, Sean Foreman, president of Baseball Reference, and Tom Schieber, uh, who has been on our show in the past, a senior curator here at the Hall of Fame. And they're going to be talking about this new initiative, the Negro Leagues or Major Leagues, and we're going to explain that uh, in full detail. Before we do that, though, we do want to thank our sponsor, the Ford Motor Company. They make this and all the other programs that we do uh, possible. They make them free of charge. We don't have to charge you as a result of this. So we're very glad uh, for the generous support of the Ford Motor Company. Again, the initiative is the Negro Leagues are major leagues. And we're going to be explaining exactly what that is. Uh, joining us, Sean Foreman, president of Baseball Reference which is part of the uh, Sports Reference franchise. Sean founded Baseball Reference 21 years ago, April of 2000. Also with us, Tom Schieber, Senior Curator at the Hall of Fame. Originally, our plan was to have Gary Ashwell, co-founder of the Seamheads website, join us too. Unfortunately, uh, Gary, uh, unable to take part today because of a family matter, but we do hope to have him on in the near future. So let's officially welcome uh, Sean and Tom to the program. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Sean, this is your first time joining us on the uh, Hall of Fame Airwaves. Uh, thanks a lot. We do appreciate uh, your time. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. Last week, uh, the official press release was sent out, uh, kind of a con conjunctive effort between yourself and Seamheads. Baseball Reference will be dramatically uh, expanding its coverage of the Negro Leagues and historical Black Major League players. Uh, this actually officially started last week, June 15th. So the major Negro Leagues from 1920 to 1948 will now be listed with the National League and American League as major leagues. So all of these statistics will be essentially integrated, incorporated uh, into one uh, convenient location, if you will. So if you look up, for example, the career record of somebody like Monty Irvin. Monty Irvin for years has been listed as having hit 121 home runs in the American and National Leagues. But now with the addition of 16 home runs that he hit in Negro Leagues competition, that will bring Irvin's major league total to 137. And that is one of just hundreds of different examples of how these records are now going to look. Before we get into all of that, Sean, I want to talk a little bit about your site, Baseball Reference, um, how it got started. And for those who don't frequent it, they, they obviously should if they're baseball fans, but for those not real familiar with what you do, what's the primary mission of your website? What has been the goal from day one? Well, we, you know, we, we, we take the history of baseball very seriously. We, um, you know, really, I'm sure many of your, of, of our listeners today, our viewers today are familiar with the baseball encyclopedia. I've got about eight of them, I think, down on the bottom shelf uh, of my bookshelf here next to me. We uh, basically have recreated the baseball encyclopedia or total baseball on our website uh, and then expanded it and kind of, you know, taken the, uh, you know, the internet has a lot of uh, positive uh, things you can do with it. And so we're not, we're not constrained by what you can carry or, or, uh, you know, or what, or, um, you know, how many pages you can put in a book. And so we've, we basically started with that and built out from there. So we have, you know, every player in major league history, we have uh, every team. We have, thanks to RetroSheet, we have box scores uh, for American and national leagues back to 1901. Uh, and so, you know, we really try to cover all of the sports that we cover in depth with, uh, you know, kind of from A to Z, uh, you know, encyclopedic uh, coverage of, of all of those, all of those sports. And so, um, you know, we, we also cover, you know, we also have last night's games. And so it's, it's a, a living encyclopedia, I guess, is how I'd describe it, uh, that, uh, you know, that grows every day when, as games are played and, and as we're able to build new, new features uh, onto the website. 
you know, that leads into my follow-up question. How do you do this, that you're able to update this right. seemingly on the fly? So if, I, if I'm a fan of the Boston Red Sox and I want to include last night's game in the statistical wrap-up for this year's team, it's going to be there. How do you, how do you possibly do this? A uh, lot, lot of computer programming. So we, you know, I, I, I kind of say we're largely a software development company. Uh, we have, you know, we'll, we're doing some hiring. We'll have nine, uh, nine full-time developers here in a couple weeks. And uh, so really it's, it's a software development company. So we've written a lot of, a lot of programs that every day pull in information. We're, we're not, you know, there's often a misconception that we're watching the games, scoring the games, things like that. But there are, there are partners that we work with who provide the, you know, last night's results. And so we, we bring those into our databases and then rerun all of these programs to update all the various pages on the site. So it's a, it's a significant process. Every morning, you know, probably two, three hours of pretty powerful computers running to, uh, to rebuild, you know, not, not every page, but many of the pages on the site. That's remarkable. Let's bring Tom Schieber into the conversation. And Tom, the Hall of Fame has a relationship with Baseball Reference. And it can be found up on the third floor, one for the books. You see toward the, the middle of your screen, but kind of in the background, is what is commonly referred to as the tower. And I guess that is uh, energized by baseball reference. Explain that, if you will. Sure, Bruce. And thanks, thanks for having me. And I'm glad Sean is here. Uh, um, so we have a, a relationship with baseball reference um, to help feed um, data to that top, what we call top 10 tower. But I'm going to take a step back before I talk about that, which is that I use baseball reference every day uh, in all facets of my work. So, um, and I use lots of other site, sites as well, but baseball reference is, is a, um, you know, a great place to, to go and, and, um, and, it's, and start your research. And so I use it for all sorts of things, not just this tower, which is actually an automated uh, thing. So, um, when everything's running smoothly, uh, I don't even have to think about it because um, the the relationship, you know, they have automatic routines that feed statistics to this tower and the tower does its job. Uh, but for all the other stuff in this picture, for example, I use baseball reference to help me understand the records. Um, uh, and I use other sources as well, but I just want to make sure everyone understands uh, the relationship with baseball reference goes well beyond this tower. The cool thing about the tower is it is a top it provides top 10 lists for um, a number of different records that you might think about, whether it's pitching, fielding, batting, or even team records. So for example, if you wanna look at um, uh, home runs, um, we'll have a list of uh, the top 10 home run hitters uh, in a career, right? And, uh, or we might have a top 10 home run hitters, hitters in a career, but those, only for players who are currently active. So if we ignore the old timers and only talk about guys now who has the most career home runs or second most or third most. Then also we split it the same way, but with instead of career, single season. So what's the all time record for single season home runs? Top 10 list. And what's the all time record for single season home runs if we're only looking at guys who are still on the active rosters? So all of this is powered by uh, baseball reference and the software that we um, had made to, to do the tower. Uh, so we had a software company do the tower, baseball reference supplied the stats, which is pretty robust. Every morning, uh, a, a bunch of tables are created by uh, the uh, programming that Sean and his team has put together. We go grab that information, put it into the server that is running the tower, and then that tower is up to date by that morning at least. Um, doesn't do things on the fly. It's it's only a, every morning, and um, gives you who's in the, who's in the top ten. But we couldn't do it without the the partnership with Baseball Reference. So by the time the museum opens nine o'clock in the morning, everything has been completely updated from last night's games. If everything works smoothly, yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. What if the game but, goes to like three or four in the morning, does that have any effect on it? I, you know what, I think it's, maybe, Sean might remember better, but I think we pull stats at like five or something like that. That seems something like that. Yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, I, obviously I think Major League Baseball changed the rules. So that's, I, I guess that could happen on the West Coast though. So I guess 2 a.m. Uh, is the, kind of the last inning start. So we, 
we, we, we do occasionally run into issues with that. We've, you know, the, the, the rebuilding the site is kind of a moving target for us. So we, we continually trying to improve and speed up that process. So Tom actually undersells it a little bit because you can, you know, not just current all time record leaders, but also you could go back to say 1971, which is the year I was born and see who is the all time record leader at the end of 1971, single season leader, active leader, stuff like that. So it's actually a kind of a moving leaderboard, you know, over time as well, which which I find very cool. Yes, I, I did undersell. I, I apologize. The, the concept is this, pretend, everything I said, but pretend instead that you walked in the room in 1971. So the, it, Barry Bonds does, has never played a major league game in 1971. So what would be the situation in 1971? Who are the top 10 all time in 71? It's a different number than in 2021. So, um, uh, that's it's it's really a top ten tower time machine is what it really should be uh, thought of as. Yeah, and just for those who think, well, it, it must have always been like this. Uh, I remember the first time I visited the Hall of Fame. I was just graduating from Hamilton College about an hour from here, 1987, and I remember coming to see what was called the records room. It was not one for the books like it is now, and the statistics, the the all time leaders and the single season leaders. That, that kind of thing was updated on a weekly basis. So when you had a current major league player who was in the top five or the top 10 of a statistical category, it was updated once a week, sort of like the sporting news. And we thought that was pretty good. But some 30 years later, it is updated almost instantaneously. And it's really remarkable to see that change. Yeah, well, actually, Bruce, in the 1980s, that was pretty good. I yeah, mean, we, were, we had to print it out. You know, or, or, or sometimes we had uh, the really old days, we would, you know, change numbers on a little board there. But when I got here, uh, and Bruce, you were, you're already here uh, 20 some odd years ago, we were still printing it out. Um, and when we decided we need to do a whole new records room and we, um, and we did, started developing this exhibit, we started developing probably a dozen years ago, um, we realized, well, that's not the world we live in anymore. That isn't going to satisfy anyone. It's got to be about as up to up to the moment as you can get. I think it's reasonable to miss the um, stats happening at, on the fly, um, besides which most of the time the museum is closed when uh, a lot of games are being played. So that it would be sort of a unnecessary luxury anyway. So uh, we knew it had to be up to up to date to last night's games. For those planning a visit to the Hall of Fame in the near future, this exhibit, one for the books up on the third floor, and that's where you will find the, uh, the Tower Time Machine, as it has been dubbed. Uh, Sean, let's talk about your announcement last week. And it's, it's kind of a headline, dramatically expanding your coverage of the Negro Leagues. Tell us specifically the ways that Baseball Reference is already doing that and is going to continue to do that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, first I want to want to give most of the credit. We, I, I feel like we are a small part of this story. We, you know, we we are the conduit through which many people will be able to see these statistics. But really, the researchers, um, you know, people like Gary Ashwell uh, and the Seam Heads group have been spending you know years and years uh, researching all of this data. So you know, both through uh, you know Saber and the Negro Leagues Committee there, and outside of the Negro Leagues Committee, and and re really, so for me, it's. It's mostly a story about the researchers, you know, finally getting kind of credit for, for keeping the flame alive and, and making sure that we, we have these stories at the forefront of our mind. And also the families and players of the, of, of the uh, players in the Negro League who, you know, who, who were, were major league players, were major league quality, were not allowed in the American and National Leagues. And, and, and you know, through their, through their uh, you know, and also, you know, credit to the, to the Hall of Fame for recognizing these players as, as the uh, Hall of Fame players, that many of them as the Hall of Fame players that they are. So, you know, I, I think we're, we're a small part of that and we're honored to be a small, to be a part of that, but, you know, really most of the credit needs to go to, go to those groups. So what we did is we, you know, we worked with, with Seam Heads uh, on this. They, they have the data set. We uh, came to an agreement with them, licensed the data set from them. Uh, you know, as you know, um, as many of you know, Major League Baseball in December announced that that they were going to make a similar move. We uh, back in August of last year, there's an article by Ben Lindbergh in The Ringer where he had kind of asked this question, you know, why aren't the Negro Leagues considered major leagues? You know, what, what's why? What's the history of that? Why did that happen? And I was interviewed as part of that process. 
And, you know, it really just kind of uh, crystallized for me, you know, why, why isn't this the case? You know, we had Negro League stats actually from, the, from a project the Hall of Fame uh, sponsored with the uh, Negro League Research and Authors Group um, that, that we had, the, Negro, the Hall of Fame had shared with us and we had on our site, but we had treated those stats as less than major league. We had to put them in our, what we call our register area, where we also have foreign league stats and independent league stats and minor league stats and college stats. And, uh, and, and major league stats. And so we had been treating these as different, as less than major league. And really this interview in the process of thinking about this, talking this with other people, you know, it, it, we decided we needed to do something about this. So we, we made that decision, you know, around the time in August or September, it took a long time and, all, and you know, it was great that major league baseball uh, also came to the same conclusion. And Sabre as well had a task force over the winter that, that, um, that was working on this project as well. So, you know, we, we started that process. We came to an agreement with Seam Heads, licensed their data. And then for the last three or four months, we've been working, our developers, uh, Kenny Jacklin, Dan Hirsch, uh, Mike Kenya, Adam Dorowski have been working on ba basically kind of unwinding a lot of the assumptions we've made over the years. You know, we, we for, I started the site 21 years ago. And so there were a lot of things that I uh, put into that as we were building this, the site, it's huge code base. And so we've, we've, burned in a lot of assumptions as to what exactly is a major league and what isn't a major league. Uh, you know, major leagues have probably 152, 154 games or 162 games. Um, and so there were a lot of assumptions that we had to unwind. And so, you know, the thing that I want people to remember is the Negro leagues, you know, we're not treating them as less than anymore, but they are different. And so, you know, the circumstances under which they played necessitated a lot of different approaches on our end as to how we present the stats, how we add context to that. And so we've really tried to make that apparent to our users as, as part of the process. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of discussion around, you know, these are not all of the stats that these players accumulated. They, you know, due to the economic circumstances around, you know, these leagues and, and the, and the uh, systemic racism that they were, that, that was going on at the time you know, they were playing a large number of barnstorming and independent games that, that were not recognized as the league season. So I know Josh Gibson's plaque, I think has over 800 home runs listed at, you know, at the Hall of Fame if you go to the plaque room. And we, we show 160 some, I think, uh, at the moment. And so that's a recognition that we're showing only league games, and but these players were playing a dramatically, a, a very large schedule outside of these league games but we're only able to show you know, one small part of that uh, at this time. So in looking at what you guys are trying to do now in terms of expanding the coverage of the Negro Leagues, am I correct in saying basically it's really two things? Number one, the Negro League statistics, they're going to be fully incorporated into American National League uh, statistics. They will be considered on the same level, all considered major league. Mm -hmm. And then also you're going to be doing uh, articles. You're going to be presenting articles from experts, historians, uh, academic folks about the Negro Leagues. Is that correct? Yeah. So we, yeah. So if you go to the site now, I mean, we, you know, the basics of our site, if you go, um, if you go and type in Josh Gibson, if you type in Dobie Moore, if you type in uh, Bullet Rogan, you will now be sent to a page that looks every bit uh, the same as Mike Trout's page or Derek Jeter's page or Joe DiMaggio's page. Uh, and so we're trying to present all, all the same information that we have for those players, um, you know, for, for, for the white players that we, that we did uh, of the time that we now for the, for the, for the African-American players. And, and so, you know, that, that's a big change. If you now go to, so we obviously have, we have league leaderboards. So, you know, obviously this isn't gonna affect the 1945 American league leaders or the national league leaders. We now have comparable leaderboards for the Negro National League, Eastern Colored League, and, and all those leagues that seven leagues that have been uh, recognized as major league um, by both Sabre and, and, and MLB. Uh, and so those now have league leaders. Uh, we have wins above replacement for all of these players. We have fielding stats. Uh, you know, we we're working on acquiring you know debut dates for all these players. And so you know all, all this information. It's not as complete yet as what the, uh, what the Mike major leagues of the time have, but it's, it's, we're working on it and, and certainly partnering with scene heads and, and other groups to try and try and uh, increase that coverage. As you mentioned, we have articles. We, you know, we felt that um, our audience, um, you know, we have, 
we have a wide variety of people who come to our site, some who are baseball historians, some who uh, started watching baseball last year. And so we wanted to put a lot of context around this. And as, you know, as I said earlier, we really feel like the researchers and the players and the families are kind of the center of the story. So we've invited, we commissioned uh, 12 articles. I think we're up to 12 articles now uh, from a variety of people, uh, researchers like Adrian Burgos, uh, expert in, in, in Latin baseball, uh, Larry Lester, who uh, helped found the Negro League Baseball Museum. We were fortunate to have Bob Kendrick and Joe Posnanski co-write a piece that appears on the site. Uh, Bob is the president, current president of the uh, uh, Negro League Baseball Museum. And so we have those articles. We also were very fortunate to have several family members. Uh, Sean Gibson, who's the great grandson of Josh Gibson, wrote a piece for our site and actually appeared with, uh, with me and Larry Lester at our press conference announcing uh, this launch last week. Uh, and then we have Vanessa Rose, who is Turkey Stern's uh, granddaughter. So we, we, uh, we've been able to get a number of uh, family members to write pieces for the site. And then we also were able to get, uh, fortunately for us, Adam Jones agreed to write a piece for us, the uh, former Baltimore Oriole outfielder. Uh, just kind of talking about his understanding of how, um, you know, it just kind of his, his, how his understanding of the new leagues evolved over time and, and, and kind of what he sees this, this recognition as, as, as meaning to him. So it's, been very gratifying to work with these people. Uh, they've all been, you know, wonderful to work with. We also have a podcast series, the Major Leagues or Major Leagues, that launched last week, so you can look for that. It's, I think, we now are in everybody, every every podcast uh, platform, and so you know, we're really trying to make our users aware of the context around these leagues, why they formed, how they were operated, and, and uh, you know, just so so, you know, I, I'm I'm. One of the points I've made is I'm surrounded now by books and uh, uh, mostly statistical books. And, you know, we've spent, you know, millions of dollars, thousands of hours of work, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours work compiling the white major leagues statistics. And so, you know, to get to a similar level for the Negro Leagues, it's going to take a substantial amount of investment. And so, you know, I hope that this is kind of the start of what we know about the statistics for these leagues and, and that we'll continue to grow in our understanding and appreciation of these leagues. Sean, we actually have a question from one of our viewers that I think ties in well as a follow-up here. Uh, it's from Joel Cohen. He writes, Bruce, in your example of Monty Irvin, will his home run total show the old number plus what was added or will it just show the new total? Uh, my guess is it's just gonna show the new total. Am I right or wrong? Uh, that's more or less correct. We, you know, if you, if you, we, we very much, you know, the, these players already had uh, to face a lot of, of uh, you know, disadvantages getting to where they were to, to, to play in the Negro Leagues. And so we didn't want to then add another, uh, you know, level of kind of segregation on top of that. So we're, we're it's very important to us that, um, you know, and we did this in, in, in um, you know, working with a lot of a lot of advisors and researchers, people who know more about this than we do, uh, and so yes, we we will show Irvin's career total. However, if you go to Irvin's page, we do have you know we do summarize it by league as well. So we would have I don't recall exactly which leagues he played in in the Negro leagues, but we would have NL and we would have you know Negro National League and then you know maybe Negro American League, and you would have the the league totals at the very bottom of his register, just as we do now with um, um, trying to think Mookie Betts, we have, you know, his AL and NL totals, you know, at the bottom of his, his batting table. So it, it'll be a similar presentation to that. Well, that certainly makes sense. Here's a question for the two of you, and it has to do with researching the Negro Leagues in general. And I want to talk about it both in terms of researching from kind of a narrative perspective and also researching from a statistical perspective. So let's start with Tom on this. Tom, when you're looking to update an exhibit like, like Ideals and Injustices or maybe other parts of the museum that deal with the Negro Leagues, what are the challenges you face in trying to delve into leagues that haven't been around for decades? There's not necessarily as much written material available on the Negro Leagues as maybe the American and National League. Where, where do you begin? Uh, is it old newspapers, magazines? What what sources are kind of your starting point when you're doing his, uh, when you're doing research into the Negro Leagues? Tom, uh, you're you're muted. And let me let me see if we can get you to unmute. Okay, there we go. There we go. I was sorry. not allowed to unmute. Okay. 
Um, can you repeat the, the, the briefly re repeat the question? I was trying to unmute and it wasn't happening. Okay. We're talking about the challenges that you would face as a curator, as a researcher, trying to update an exhibit like Ideals and Injustices, okay. uh, which is our exhibit about the history of black baseball. What are the challenges in trying to delve into the Negro Leagues, given that there's maybe not as much ready written material? Is it, is it the old newspapers? Is it the black newspapers of the day, magazines? What's what's your starting point for researching the Negro Leagues? Um, so let me say, I guess I want to separate this out into a couple of different things. In terms of updating um, exhibits, we have a lot of updating to do. Um, we have decided uh, to embrace the Negro Leagues as major leagues. Uh, specifically, uh, we are in agreement that the seven Negro Leagues designated by uh, SABER, a Society for American Baseball Research, and um, uh, Major League Baseball uh, from 1920 to 1948 um, uh, are major league, um, they considered major leagues. Um, so once we made that decision, um, there's a lot of, there's a, honestly, there's a lot of rereading of what we've written. There's hundreds of thousands of words in our museum. There's uh, countless, countless stories in the museum. We have to revisit all of these in light of an assumption that had been made for a long time, which is, yeah, they're not major league. Well, that's wrong. And now we have to correct for that. Um, so that's a long process. And just as Sean was saying, that it's going to take a while to really uh, sort of uh, embrace, and not embrace, but just sort of uh, fathom the amount of work to do uh, to present the statistics. Um, we have the same challenge to do beyond statistics, stories, uh, biographies, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, we're definitely moving forward with that, but it doesn't happen overnight as one might imagine. And I wish it could, because I wish we could just snap our fingers and we're done with that. But it's a, it's a, a long drawn out process. Um, from a research standpoint, we um, are, uh, as with any um, exhibit or any work we're doing, we look to other historians, but we also look internally to do our own research. So, um, you know, we're, We've used seam heads for quite a while. As I mentioned, we use baseball reference. We use uh, Sabre. Uh, I have lots of connections in the baseball history world and I, can, I contact people and ask them questions to help me work on an exhibit or an article or a program, whatever the case may be. But then we do our own research. So yes, we use a lot of contemporary sources. I'm a big fan of using contemporary sources. And happily we have um, a world we live in where a lot of uh, contemporary sources have been digitized and are readily accessible. Some of them are not, and that takes a little more legwork, uh, but it's important legwork to do. That's where a lot of, from an equally standpoint, a lot of the um, missing box scores are gonna be found by not looking in digitized sources because there are more obscure papers or papers that just for whatever reason haven't been scanned in and OCR'd. And uh, progress will be made there, it's slower. And, uh, but the work that CMEDS and, uh, and by the way, lots of other, uh, um, groups have done um, is incredible and, and we're just so thankful for them just as like we're thankful for historians who've done all sorts of work over the many many decades of baseball history um, research so uh, hopefully that you know we'll continue to, to uh, add on and and reassess but that's uh, our plan moving forward is lots of reassessing and lots of rewriting and uh, working on brand new exhibits one of the things that I've always enjoyed doing here at the Hall of Fame, you go into the Giamatti Research Center, you've got every issue of the Sporting News, you've got every issue of Sports Illustrated, you've got every issue of Sport Magazine, and they're great resources, but they don't necessarily have a lot about the Negro Leagues. That really can't be what you're going to rely on because it's just not going to be there. So that really kind of forces you to go maybe outside of the box, look at the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender. Uh, the black newspaper that was in Kansas City that is escaping my memory right now. That really has to be your focus, right, Tom? Um, that is, I would say that's my, my number one go-to is to find, like I said, these contemporary papers. Um, they're actually in, in certain uh, white-owned uh, papers, you do get s some legal coverage, but uh, most of them are African-American papers. Um, but, uh, and there's other sources as well. I mean, let's not forget our, our own collection here at the Hall of Fame. We have a number of scorecards. That's good information, not just from the game itself. 
So if the scorecard is filled out, we know how a player did or whatever. But look at the entire scorecard. Look at the advertisements in the scorecard. Look at the rosters. Look at, um, you know, there's a lot of information there by, beyond the numbers. Um, so we have those. We have um, lots of other contemporary publications. So, you know, it's this is nothing new when it comes to doing baseball research. You, you mine everything and you mine some stuff you don't even think is going to be useful and it turns out to be useful. So it's a, uh, it's a, I want to say 80% art, 80% art and 20% science in trying to, um, to pull out and suss out information about any topic in baseball history. And, uh, and that's no different for Negro Leagues research. Sean, how about from your perspective, how exactly do you research Negro League statistics? Newspapers, magazines, other sources. Yeah. I, so I, again, I you know it's it's unfortunate that Gary wasn't able to join us today because this is certainly certainly the question question uh, best posed to him. You know, I I, I will uh, att attempt to answer as best as I can, but keep in mind this is you know lar largely secondhand. So I you know we've certainly talked to them a lot about the process and and what goes into that. I mean, largely it's it's you know primary sources like you described the um, you know the newspapers of the time. You know, uh, Larry Lester, uh, you know, who was on our conference call, uh, our press conference last week, you know, made the point that, you know, we, we actually have more data for the 1920s than we do for the 30s and 40s, because in the 20s, you know, the newspapers were thriving. It was a, you know, a boom economic time in the U.S. And so there was extensive coverage of these leagues in the black newspapers of the time. You know, there were beat writers following the teams and, and that the Great Depression uh, caused, you know, a pullback in that regard. And so there was less coverage. Uh, of, of the 30s, so we have fewer uh, box scores for for the, the game for the league games in that year, and then in the late 40s, you know, you saw that a lot of the black press was then covering Jackie Robinson, Larry Doby, and the integration of, of the American and National Leagues, and so that was um, you know we were missing you know we tend to be missing a few more games in the, uh, in, the in the late 40s as well. So you know for me this is all as I said there's been this huge investment in you know research in the American and National Leagues just you know all the way back to you know, previous to the Big Mac baseball encyclopedia, you know, stretching back 70, 80, 90, 100 years. Uh, and so, you know, the Negro Leagues, you know, what we know about them is going to be different than what we know about uh, the American and National Leagues. And so there's a lot of work to be done. And I, I find that kind of exciting. I always, I know David Neft a little bit, who, uh, who was the editor of the, uh, of the baseball encyclopedia. And uh, I always felt a little jealous uh, talking to him. He got to do all the fun stuff. He got to, uh, you know, set down, you know, what these original numbers were and who these original players were. And now we have 3,400 additional players who need, you know, we don't have uh, birthdays and death dates for all these players. We don't have, uh, may not have school information for where they attended high school or college. Uh, we may not have where they're, where they're buried uh, at, at this point, or even, you know, their stats or sometimes their first name. And so now, you know, through the internet, uh, probably a number of the, you know, viewers on this call could could volunteer, work with, you know, a group like RetroSheet or a group like Scene Heads, and uh, and look through newspapers.com, go to their library and look at microfilm and, and help, you know, fill in this record, and I'll take part in, in in building up this, you know, historical record of these major league seasons that we, you know, right now are incomplete. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that as we go forward, we will have more and more uh, information about these players. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of like I said, it's an exciting time. It's, it's certainly an opportunity for someone who wants to uh, wants to dive in and, and contribute to, uh, to baseball research. Sean, given how often new information is going to be coming in, how fluid are these statistics going to become? Are you going to maybe have set times of the year where you update them or do you update them on the fly? And are you concerned about possibly creating confusion for fans? I, I certainly understand the concern around that. We don't know what kind of cadence we're going to have yet. I know, for instance, our 1945 and 46 stats are probably out of sync with what Scene Heads has on their site now. Uh, so there will probably be an update coming up sometime soon uh, regarding that. Um, so I, I, I do feel for Tom, who, if, who, you know, if he's going to be, you know, if he and his staff are going to be running around, you know, updating uh, cards on, on, the, on the wall, it, it could be a bit of a losing battle uh, over the next four to five years. Um, but I, you know, I think one, one thing I'm aware, I'm well aware of, and probably our audience is not as aware of, is that even in, you know, the American and National League stats, there's a lot of fluidity in there as well, you know, through the work of a group like Retrosheet. We know that we're missing RBIs for some players. We know that we're missing runs scored. 
I, you know, I joke that, uh, you know, Ty Cobb's hit total is like 41.89 plus or minus five. We don't know exactly where in that range uh, his actual hit total is. Uh, new discoveries are made, you know, uh, and, and, and so numbers change. And so there, there is, you know, even, you know, in the last two to three years, we've had a case where I think we, uh, we found a player who we thought had played in two different leagues was actually two different players. And, and so we had to split a record uh, between, you know, back in the early 19, 1900s. And so this stuff happens quite often uh, on our site and, and people probably don't see it because it's usually, it's not, you know, we're not removing seasons from Hank Greenberg or, uh, or Lou Gehrig or anything like that, but it's, it's going to be a, an ongoing process um, a, as we go through. And so, you know, I, I suppose a, you know, maybe a quarterly update would make sense. We'll certainly uh, advertise it on our site when we make those changes and, and uh, add those updates, but it, it, is, it is going to be fluid. And so, you know, we, right now, um, you know, as we list, you know, single season ERA leaders or single season uh, batting average leaders, you know, those numbers will change uh, over time and, and, and may, uh, you know, may change. One, one issue we have, and I mentioned we don't have, so for instance, for 1947, uh, we, we don't have every game that was played in the league. We know how many games were scheduled in the league, which I think is on the order of 65, 70, maybe 80 games uh, in that season but we may only have box scores for about 35, 40 of those games. And so we're basing our league leaders on those 35, 40 game values. And so, um, you know, so over time, those numbers may change as we're adding more, more uh, box scores and more records and more information uh, to those seasons. So it definitely is going to be a moving target. It's probably a good, a good lesson in historiography and how history is, uh, is recorded. Uh, and so, you know, I hope, I hope people will, uh, will contribute and, and, and seek to volunteer, uh, you know, and, and help us along that path. In an ideal world, we're at 100% complete and accurate coverage of what happened in the Negro Leagues. Right. If you were to try to put a percentage of where we are now, we had 50%, 60%, 70%, or is there just no way of knowing? Well, I, I would say in terms of like full season stats, we're probably closer to 75, 80 um, percent really? in that regard. More, more complete in the 20s uh, and then kind of getting less complete as we get go forward to 48. Um, and so we do, you know, if you go to our site, if you go to the main landing page for the Negro Leagues or Major Leagues, we actually have a pretty extensive data coverage description there, you know, because we want to be up front with people so they know what, you know, what we have on the site and what we don't. And so, um, you know, we list, and, and you can also see we have similar, you know, similar coverage for, uh, for, for the white major leagues as well, you know, outlining, you know, games we have box scores for, games we only have, we have play-by-play for, things like that. But I know RetroSheet is working, you know, is starting kind of uh, to get off the ground with, with covering Negro League games as well. And so, you know, I, I, like I said, I, the beautiful thing about this is it's kind of a ratchet, right? We only go forward in these counts. We don't lose games as we go. So, you know, the numbers are only going to get better and better as, as, as we go forward. So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, like I said, there's been a huge amount of investment in researching the white major leagues. And, and we, it's going to take time and effort and money to, uh, to get us to the same level with the, with the black major leagues. Hey, Bruce, can I, can I add something to this? Um, sure. uh, I totally, totally agree with what Sean's saying. And one thing I, I think it's important that to, for people to keep in mind, and hopefully um, in our museum we do this, especially in our exhibit, uh, one for the books about baseball records. Um, and, and that is, um, you know, just because uh, not, not every league is the same. That doesn't mean they're not, uh, they're not major league. It just, they're, they're, they can be different and have different uh, challenges with statistics. Uh, for a long time, the American League and National League have been actually significantly different with a designated hitter rule. That's a big difference. Um, that doesn't mean that the American League or the National League is not major. And um, I think the, the, the message here, and I think Sean was kind of hinting at this earlier, is that the, um, each one of these Negro Leagues, and then we're talking about seven different leagues here that, that are designated as major league, is different. They're different from the American League. They're different from the National League. It doesn't mean that they're not major. And I really hope that um, by designating these leagues as major, it, I think a lot of people might think that means, okay, now everything is the same. I think really what it needs to highlight is how much things are very different and to appreciate that difference. And one of the differences, for example, is the Negro League uh, regular season schedules tended to be 50, 60, 70 games, something like that, that which is half 
or, or even less than half uh, the number of games played by the National League and American League for the vast majority of, let's say, the 20th century. Um, that doesn't mean they're not major league. It, what it really plays up is the challenges faced by these leagues, given the uh, systemic racism they had to deal with as black business owners. Uh, I'm actually pretty darn impressed that they were to pull off what they did, given the hurdles they were placed in their way. So, um, and there's all sorts of other differences that are that come out of it as well. But I hope through this, um, what's not happening is not we're not saying now everyone is the same. Um, just as my, I would say the Yankees aren't the same as the Kansas City Athletics. No one would ever ever claim that. Um, but they all have uh, their differences, and um, given the different situations. But what what isn't what we're trying to rectify is what isn't different is these guys are playing at the top level they could possibly play, and that's the major league level. Yeah, and Tom, I'd also follow, follow, up, the whole sorry, of the follow up with Tom there. I, I would say, you know, there's even dispute among the white major leagues, right? I mean, the Union Association, 1883, a lot of researchers would say that was not a major league. And, you know, we listed it, it's listed as major league. It's in all the encyclopedias. We list the National Association of 1871 to 75 as a, as a major league, major league baseball and the lives don't. So there's, you know, there's room for ambiguity here. I, I joke. Um, I, when I die, I want, when I get to heaven, I want to see God's baseball encyclopedia and then we'll know what, then I'll know what all the records are and how many hits Ty Cobb had, how many home runs Josh Gibson had. So, you know, I, I think we're, we're working towards an ideal and, and, you know, work is probably the, 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 the primary word. Sean, along those lines, something like the federal league, do you regard that as major league? We, we do on our side. I, you know, I had never really understood. I didn't realize there was any dispute about that. I was on Rob Nyer's podcast last week and he, uh, apparently one of his, uh, his cause, uh, one of his major causes is to, uh, is to strike a major league designation from the federal league. So I, I don't know if it's a party of one or, or, or more, but, um, we, we do consider the federal league a major league. You know, the, the Pacific coast league is interesting too, uh, for years. And it's still the, 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 the way it is now, the Pacific Coast League is regarded as minor league, uh, right. AAA, very high minor league. But there is actually a push out there. There are some people who believe that at one point at their peak, maybe the teams in the Pacific Coast League were almost major league. So right. you're right. There is some fluidity there. Yeah, a a absolutely. And, you know, and the point is, you know, we're not we're not saying that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I would definitely agree. I, I've certainly heard that argument myself. And, and, you know, without the affiliated farm teams, you can certainly make that, make that case. And, and, and so, you know, it, it's obviously you have situations where, you know, one team might dominate a, lead a league for a long time and maybe the competitive balance is out of whack. But, you know, you could probably make the same case for the 60s, you know, American League, American League in the 1960s as well. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's clear that these were the top players. And, you know, we have an, actually have an article by Todd Peterson uh, who actually put together a book, uh, your audience might enjoy it, called The Major Leagues Were Major Leagues. We kind of cribbed that for, for the title of our presentation uh, and updated it to the present present tense. But, um, you know, and he had that book, he runs through, I think, good 20, 30 page essay as, you know, kind of looking at records between the Negro Leagues and the white major leagues and, and, and you know, making a fairly strong, uh, you know, numerate case that, that this was high level baseball being played by these players. Sean, I think there are seven Negro Leagues that you'll be recognizing as equivalent to the American National League. Tell us a little bit about those leagues. I, you know, I, to be honest with you, Bruce, I'm probably not the best person to ask, ask about that. We've been running as fast as we can just to get this out on the site. So I, I need to, uh, I need to set aside some time myself to get, really dig in into the full breadth of the, uh, uh, of the update. So I, I was worried you were going to ask me to name all seven. I, I'm probably not, probably not the person to, to ask about that. It's unfortunate Gary isn't, isn't able to be with us. Well, I can't name all seven either without checking it, but obviously you've got the Negro National League, which was what Rube Foster started yeah, two, two in 1920. Uh, Eastern Colored League, uh, Negro American League. Those are, those are three that come immediately to mind. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think there were two, we, we recognized two separate versions of the Negro National League, I know. And, and um, yeah, I'm, bl I'm blanking on the, uh, on the, on the other uh, three. Of them. Uh, Tom, I want to go back to you for a moment because I want to talk about the history of the Hall of Fame and the museum and efforts to recognize Negro leaguers over the years. Now we think about current exhibits like ideals and injustices, the history of 
of black baseball. Uh, we think about, um, well, obviously those Negro leaguers who have been elected to the Hall of Fame, starting with Satchel Page in 1971. So those are some of the obvious things that come to mind, but what are the other ways that the museum has tried to recognize the Negro Leagues over time? Sure, so I think, um, yes, you can, you can start with the fact that um, starting in the early, early 1970s, uh, there were, began to be uh, more uh, attention being paid to the history of the Negro Leagues. It starts slow, but it, uh, you know, uh, the book Only the Ball Was White is a seminal book that really kind of got the ball uh, rolling on, on that kind of research and those stories. Um, and uh, that those are included in the baseball library. Now we have a vast collection of uh, books and uh, as well as library other library materials like ephemera and media, various forms of media, et cetera, about the Negro Leagues. Um, the fact that um, we did uh, make the decision to recognize Negro Leaguers as uh, potential Hall of Famers and with, with uh, the big moment being with Satchel Page being inducted in 1971 and, and soon on his heels, uh, great players like Josh Gibson and, and uh, um, just you know, numerous others, Cristobal Torriante and, and you know, Monty Irvin's career kind of split over two. Uh, he was kind of half in the, uh, the uh, formerly all white major leagues and then uh, half in the, the Negro major leagues. Um, then move forward to the late seventies and we actually started uh, with a, a small exhibit about the history of the Negro leagues. Um, and that grew and grew and grew as exhibits get updated or revamped or start from scratch. Um, and then move forward to just after the turn of the century, 2000, 2001, I think it was 2000 when we uh, uh, made a call for uh, um, research to be done uh, on the Negro Leagues and Negro League statistics. Uh, um, and out of that came at the time, the best statistics available, uh, which then we partnered with Sean and, and got, um, it was wonderful those come, it came out in a baseball reference. Um, and that was a multi-year process uh, to get um, that research done. And then a, a great uh, book about um, Negro League Baseball came out of that as well. Um, and then um, to where we are right now, which is we are developing a brand new exhibit about the black baseball experience, which quite frankly is, uh, much larger than the Negro League story. The Negro League story is uh, probably um, the peak in terms of quality of play, but um, just like with the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, in terms of that being the peak of quality of play and probably the best known to a lot of people when it talks, when we're talking about women in baseball, the history of women in baseball goes back to the very beginnings of baseball, period. And the history of the black baseball experience goes back to the very beginnings of baseball, period. So, uh, our current exhibit, Ideals and Injustices, uh, does talk about um, the Negro Leagues as well as um, post and pre-Negro League baseball. Um, we're going to start from scratch and do a brand new exhibit. I'm extremely excited about the possibilities of that. Um, and it's going to take a while because we're, what we're not going to do is we're not going to try and get it up quick. The point is not to do it quickly. The point is to do it the best possible way so our visitors can have the richest, most engaging and um, uh, most accurate experience. So it's a long, a long history of of uh, the Hall of Fame, um, um, embracing the, these stories and learning from them and moving forward. One thing I wanted to mention is coming up in August will be the 50th anniversary of Satchel Page's induction. He's the first player to be elected to the Hall of Fame based on what he did in the Negro Leagues. Now I know some people will say. What about Jackie Robinson, who played for the Kansas City Monarchs? Well, Robinson played one season in the Negro Leagues, but primarily inducted for what he did as a pioneer and as a Brooklyn Dodger. Uh, Satchel Page, the first player to be inducted primarily for what he did as a phenomenal Negro Leagues pitcher. So we're coming up on that 50th anniversary, and we're actually going to do a special show uh, on that day about the 50th anniversary of Page's election and induction. Um, let's start getting some questions in because we're getting a lot of messages in the chat room. So I want to get to as many of those as I can. We're going to start with Ryan. Ryan wants to know, has Major League Baseball officially decided that 1920 to 1948 are the years that will be considered major 
I've only heard those are Sabre's suggestions at this point. Sean, can you clarify on that? Uh, I, I believe if you go back and read their press release, they agree. They it corresponded to what Sabre had said. I, I haven't read that recently, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they actually enumerated the leagues in there. But I, you know, that that would be I, I would I direct Ryan to go look for uh, for Rob Manfred's uh, release. Okay. Uh, question from Mark Pellish. Uh, how about Henry Aaron? Would he again be the all-time home run king if we factor in his Negro League statistics? If if we did factor in his Negro League statistics, uh, he would be, but he played in the Negro Leagues in the 50s. And so we're only considering from 20 to 48, uh, you know, due to the negative effects that integration had on the Negro Leagues, um, you know, which is kind of a whole another discussion, you know, I, I mean, that, that uh, you know, how the rating of those leagues took place uh, in the late 40s. Um, but so we're not recognizing those seasons by Aaron as major league. So Bonds is still the uh, still the all-time home run. Okay. Uh, question. Like, like, sorry, Bruce. Like, likewise, there were several women who played in the fifties in the Negro Leagues. Unfortunately, they are not. They don't do not receive a major league treatment on our site. They it will appear in our in our register section when we're able to you know add those seasons as well. So it's it's uh, but forty eight is the last season that we're considering as as a major league. Uh, the Negro Leagues is major. All right, Bruce. Bruce, Bruce, can I ask a quick question of Sean? Sure. So, and I think this is what you're hinting at, Sean. So right now, uh, the statistics that are up there are of the uh, seven leagues that operated between 20 and 48 that are considered major. There's other leagues, by the way, that were yes. that operated during that time frame that yep. were not major. But of the other uh, uh, organized Negro leagues, um, one, let's pretend for a moment that we can consider them minor leagues. Uh, you definitely have minor league st uh, stats on your site that are of uh, white white minor leagues essentially, right. uh, and then integrated ones. Is there a thought about potentially including uh, those league statistics, just not including them as major league, just as uh, minor league? We, we we have many of them already on the site, actually. So you know, if you, I think the like 1917 Chicago Americans, we have uh, you know Ameri maybe American Giants. I uh, blanking on the exact details, but if you go to our landing page, we kind of have a long description of it, and, and you know, call out the fact that this is not. 20 to 48 is not the entirety of, of black baseball in America. And so, you know, we, we do have extended coverage beyond that. You know, one other point that, uh, you know, that, that's probably worth considering is, you know, for many years, uh, some teams, some very high quality teams, teams with all of famers on it, would play an exhibition or a barnstorming schedule instead of taking part in these leagues. And so the Kansas City Monarchs are an example of that. You'll, you'll look at their franchise history, you'll see gaps where, they are not in a particular league uh, because they chose to play a, you know, 150, 160, you know, 200 game barnstorming or exhibition schedule that season. Uh, and so, you know, for economic reasons, that was a better, better option for them. And so, um, you know, those were major league quality teams often playing, you know, often playing a lot of the teams we list as major league for those seasons. And so, you know, I think it's something of an open question. Should we consider a 1931 Kansas City Monarchs season to be, consider some of those games to be major league games and, and include records. So, you know, some of the, some of the famous players have gaps in their records uh, due to, due to reasons like that. So it's, yeah, we're trying to present this entire, uh, you know, cosmos uh, uh, of it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, right now we're, you know, only able to show a part of it. Right. It's, al it's almost like uh, it's not quite equivalent to, but, you know, for a long time, Notre Dame didn't play in a conference, right. They were, they were doing their own thing. Uh, but, I think everyone would say they were a powerhouse in college right. football during that time frame, and so, you know, you can't just go by these the strict rules. Maybe look at other things as well. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah, just to stress the point. I mean, we're you know we're we're, we're not we want to make the case they're not less than, but they are different, and so this is just one of the many ways in which they are different. Right. Question comes in from Robert Ewing: How many Negro leaguers were added to the major league records? And what is the total number of players that now are classified as having played in the history of baseball, the history of the major leagues? Uh, so we we currently, if you go to the front page of our site, we have a player section and we always list like the current total number of players. So I think we're at 22,400 and some, maybe 450 or so, uh, depending on how many debuts there were in the last week or so. Uh, and so previously there was some, uh, with some hullabaloo, a player, um, um, I'm blanking on the player. Josh name. Donaldson. Well, uh, no, we had a player oh. who was the 20,000th player in major league history. Uh, Godoy, I think from the Mariners, uh, and based on our record keeping was the 20,000th major league player. 
we then made this release, which then no longer he's now the 22nd, you know, 22nd thousand and 400 and, you know, and 10th or something like that. So, um, so I think we've added, so we there are 3,400 players, some, many of whom also had records in, you know, the American and National League. I think we're up to another 2,400 players from, from what we had previously. And so if you're curious, the, the new uh, 20,000 player is Randall Delgado, uh, who hmm. I think you maybe seven or eight years ago, something like that. Here's a question that's more speculative than anything else. Uh, when is it felt that the Negro League, when it is felt, I should say, that the Negro League statistics are at, at an updated stage where we're pretty close to that 100% threshold? What are the chances that a printed encyclopedia of baseball could be produced with all updated statistics? Well, get, given it's been, I don't know, 12 years, 13 years since we've had a printed encyclopedia, um, Probably not great, I would say. I mean, I, I guess, you know, a, a Negro League encyclopedia would have, um, it wouldn't go out of date uh, the second you printed it. So that, that would be useful, I, I, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, we, we certainly have no, we're, we're pretty tied to the digital uh, format. So it's, 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 it's uh, I, I'm not sure the economics will, uh, will argue for that anytime, anytime soon. There are many, um, there's the uh, Negro League um, Biographical Encyclopedia by Jim Riley and, and a few other things along those lines that attempt to, you know, list all of these players, uh, and, and and we hope to actually license those bios for our site at some point. This question directed toward Tom. It comes from Paul Julian. Uh, my question is about advertising and promoting the digital collections you have, uh, interviews with Satchel Paige, Cool Papa Bell, etc. At the Hall of Fame. Uh, will more promotion from the hall of these uh, great documents and uh, audio and video files, will, will that be part of the plan for the future? Uh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, we, we're every day uh, we're adding more and more uh, items to the digital collection that is being made available to the public. And uh, um, we're putting more and more funds and time and effort into that as, as well. Um, and we'll be uh, doing what we can to get um, uh, the great stories of the Negro Leaguers and, and pre-Negro League segregated baseball as well um, out. And uh, one of the challenges, of course, is, well, it's not really much of a challenge, but but there's a limited, from an artifact standpoint, there's not a whole lot out there, quite frankly. We have, we have a lot of material uh, for a, a lot of different levels of baseball, but uh, for the uh, major Negro Leagues, um, there's not a whole lot of artifacts or uh, ephemera that exist in the world, let alone in our collection. Uh, our collection is excellent uh, uh, compared to almost everywhere else, but uh, compared to what was saved and handed down in um, the rest of baseball, whether it's white major leagues or non-white major leagues, it's, um, it's uh, unfortunately quite low. Um, so. Uh, there's less there, but it's, uh, yeah, we have still a lot, a lot of work to do to get um, more of it available to the public. Question I have for either or both of you, most historians agree that the best players in the Negro Leagues were certainly the equal of the best players in the American and National Leagues. What is the general consensus of the quality of Negro Leagues teams in terms of the depth of the rosters compared to the AL and NL rosters of the same time? Uh, do we feel that they were equal, uh, as deep, not as deep? Let's we'll start with Sean. I mean, I, I feel pretty comfortable with where we've come down on this. That you know, that that the, the full rosters of those leagues. You know, I, I mean, it's it's you know, th this question um, you know uh, often comes you know from the direction of well, what you know, uh, the lower levels of the of of the uh, of the Negro League teams. Uh, you know, what was the quality of play there? But we could ask the same question of, of, you know, on the white major leagues as well. You know, there were probably several hundred uh, players playing for the Phillies and the, and the, and the Braves and, and, you know, other teams that, you know, would not have been in the major leagues in, in a fully integrated American and National League setting. Uh, and so, you know, one where, you know, you weren't just picking the, the top players where it was, you know, a fair competition for, uh, for playing spots. And so, you know, I think that that argument cuts both ways. Um, you know, there are, there are, there are um, certainly white teams that would have done very well in the Negro Leagues, and there are certainly white teams that would have done very poorly in the Negro Leagues. And so it's, it's um, you know, I, I, I think, 
you know, we, we are providing the data. If there are researchers who want to work on that question, you know, we certainly, uh, our data is, you know, you can export a great deal of our data and, and use it and put it in spreadsheets and, and make those uh, arguments yourself. But we're, uh, we're pretty comfortable with where we came down on that question. Tom, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I totally agree with Sean. He nailed it. Um, you know, uh, there's lots of players today uh, that uh, are, you know, by, first of all, by definition, um, all half of all major leaguers are lo are lower than average, <laughs> and, and, you know. So, so you you have a depth. Talk to any team that's that's struggling to to get to 500, and they'll say we got a depth problem, and that's not a, a situation with major whether some, the team is major league or not. It has to do with the challenges of fielding a, a, a professional baseball club. Yeah. So uh, I think it's kind of a a, a non issue, um, and and. Uh, Certainly, we don't want to penalize uh, um, a, a great ball player or even a good ball player just because he played with on the same team guys who weren't as good as him. And saying so, well, if the depth is lower, that means somehow the team is not major. Uh, you know, uh, you talk, you can talk about it, any team like like that, and uh, that's not a way to define a, a major league. Yeah. Final question for Sean Foreman, and we could go for a couple of hours. I'm already extending into our second hour here because uh, I think this is important, but I, I do want to get this question in. Sean, what kinds of feedback uh, have you been receiving regarding the Negro Leagues or the Major Leagues initiative? Are you getting any negative feedback? Is it mostly positive uh, or is it just people have lots of questions like I do? <laughs> uh, it's it's. Most it's almost certainly been been positive. I, I uh, you know, we've had a lot of wonderful feedback, uh, a lot of reporters uh, asking about it. We had the opportunity to talk about it with a number of people. And you know, we, we're getting emails from people uh, thanking us for doing this, seeing notes on Twitter, uh, people thanking us for, 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 for doing this. And so it's been very gratifying. I, I feel we, um, you know, as a company, uh, several of several of my coworkers have, you know, have expressed that they feel like this is the most important project they've ever worked on, you know, at work. And I certainly feel that way. And so it's been, it's been very gratifying to go through the process and, and uh, you know, and, and, and to make these numbers available to the public. And so, you know, like I said, you know, I can't, I can't say enough about the partners uh, that we've worked with, the seam heads and Gary Ashwell and his group and Larry Lester, and then the families of, of the players like Sean Gibson and that have all, have all been incredibly generous to us with their time and their expertise. And so we've, we've been very fortunate to have be able to put together a, a really good team to, uh, to work on this project. Very good. Final question for Tom Schieber. Tom, you mentioned earlier that you're really planning to do ideals and injustices, our exhibit about black baseball, really do it completely over from scratch. I assume that's already begun. Uh, sounds like it it's, it's, it's down the line several years. Can you give us a little bit more of a, a timetable on that? Can't give you a great timetable, unfortunately. We're, we're, we're in what I would call pre-development, believe it or not, <laughs> um, just trying to get uh, an understanding of how we move forward responsibly. The last thing we wanna do is rush that early development of an exhibit only to find we've gone down the wrong fork in the road. And, um, and so we need to make sure everything we're doing is well thought out ahead of time so that we're not backtracking and, and reconsidering, you know, there's gonna be a certain amount of that, but, but you can't do anything significant like that. So we wanna make sure we get all our ducks in a row. Um, but I, I wanna emphasize that it's, um, the exhibit is a brand new exhibit. I, uh, I catch myself sometimes saying we're recurating the current exhibit or, uh, or, or redoing ideals and injustices. I think we can just uh, absolutely just say, hey, we're doing a, a brand new exhibit about the black baseball experience and leave it at that, uh, which means that the old one will be going away. And, um, you know, the uh, Ideals and Justice, which used to be called Pride and Passion, um, it's lasted 25 years. That's an incredibly long time for an exhibit to last. And what that really means is it's after 25 years, I don't care what subject you're talking about. There's a lot to reassess and not by simply changing one label or two labels reassessing the entire way you tell stories, the understanding of stories. And it, it, it talks about, uh, I think what we started off the, the, our presentation about, which is um, there have been so much advances thanks to historians and statisticians um, and just the world we live in. There's so many advancements with our knowledge, so many changes in our perception and our understanding of history. Um, 
and, that, and, and, and quite frankly, uh, such great uh, new ways to present history uh, through new technology or new storytelling techniques, um, that it's time to brand, do to do justice to this uh, exhibit. Um, we need to re we need to do it again. We're just getting started. We're just scratching the surface at this point. There's a lot well to do for both of these gentlemen and lots of other people as well. Uh, we want to thank uh, Tom Schieber, senior curator at the Hall of Fame, for joining us. And of course, also thank uh, Sean Foreman, president of Baseball Reference and Sports Reference, which, uh, well, Baseball Reference now around for 21 years. And this may be the most daunting task that Baseball Reference has ever undertaken. We do thank you, Sean and Tom, as well. It's been a lot of fun. It's been very informative. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, our thanks to Sean Foreman and Tom Schieber for joining us for this virtual Voices of the Game. Also, we thank uh, the Ford Motor Company for their generous support of this and other programs. Uh, we're very appreciative to them. Uh, we're able to make these programs free of charge because of Ford Motor Company and its generosity. Uh, thanks for joining us here in Cooperstown. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.